Hi, Journey in Our Church family. Welcome home. I'm Bree, and I'm here where Kidventure happens on Sundays for kindergarten through fourth grade. Normally, it's full of energy from kids playing and laughing. We gather here, and God's good news is presented through worship songs, games, and interactive Bible stories. Kids get an opportunity to find real-life application from the Bible point in their small groups, too. Learning about Jesus is fun. Little Venture, the preschool age, is a very busy room with lots of hands-on activities, dancing, singing, and getting to know Jesus in a way that they can relate and understand. Another exciting room is We Venture. In here, kids get their first experience of the love and kindness of the church family. They hear how much Jesus loves them over and over again from our amazing volunteers. A kids ministry that presents the good news of Jesus to kids at their level has been part of the DNA of Journey in Our Church from the very beginning. We dreamed of a place where kids would be so excited to come to church, they would wake their parents up to come. Even though the kids can't be together here right now, we're still connecting with over 100 kids, birth through fourth grade, by sending them something in the mail. It takes hours to put together, but kids matter and kids are so important. Thank you for joining us today. Let's worship.
But I come and I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one. Welcome to the Adams Home again. We're we're glad you could join us. I'm going to say right now, um, stay tuned. At the end of the message today, there's something I want to share with you by way of announcement, so you don't want to miss it. So make sure you hang with us till the end. Um, we're glad to have you here. Last week we were in week five of a series on Elijah, and we talked about depression and how Elijah got depressed. But we also talked about God's prescription for how to get out of that and. Um, this is a huge issue right now in the world because of what's going on, what's been going on. But I want to backtrack a bit, and I want to look at something again in a little bit um, from a little bit more depth, from a little bit different angle. We might have gotten the wrong impression the way we looked at it. So I think it applies big time to our current situation, to our state of affairs. So we pick up the story. After Elijah is afraid, remember, and runs for his life from Jezebel, he ran away in a big way, as far as he could get, the, far, the southernmost city, and then farther into the desert, remember. He's all depressed, and he wants to die. And in, in 1 Kings 19, verse 5, it says this, Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was some bread, baked over hot coals in a jar of water. That's kind of cool. I, you know, the angel did it or God just did it. It's kind of cool that he did that. He ate and drank, he said, and then it says, and then he laid down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat for the journey is too much for you. So he got up, ate and drank again. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days 
and forty nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. That's amazing. That's an amazing story. But he gets there, he's all depressed, and God asks him what he's doing there. Now remember, God knew. God wasn't asking him because he didn't know. He was asking because he wanted Elijah to say it. He wanted Elijah to verbalize it because that helps us to be able to speak out loud what we're going through. God can handle it, remember? So what Elijah does is he, he complains. He complains that he is the only one left who's following God. And we know that's not true. God says he's going to have 7,000 other ones. There was two groups of 50 prophets hidden in caves. He wasn't the only one left. And remember, we talked last week about how what God does is he destroys and demolishes our lies with his truth, replaces it with his truth, because that's what can lift us out of the problem that we're in. And here's what God says to him, starting in verse 11, 1 Kings 19. The Lord said, go out. Remember, he went in the cave on Mount Horeb and was going to stand there and go to sleep. He says, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord. The Lord is about to pass by. So he tells Elijah, get out of the cave, go out, stand on the mountain. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart. It shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the, after the earthquake came a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. After the fire, it says, came a gentle whisper. Now, maybe not instantly right after. Okay, And I say that because where was Elijah? Okay, According to verse 11, he's out standing on a mountain, right? But this is what verse 11 says, moving right along after the fire came a gentle whisper, he must have gone back into the cave before that happened. Because in verse 13, it says this, when Elijah heard it, heard what? Heard the gentle whisper. He pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. So he had had the, the, uh, the wind, the, the, the whirlwind thing, the earthquake, the fire. Um, I can understand why he'd want to cover up a little bit to go out when he hears something else, you know. But when he heard that, he'd already gone back into the cave. He comes back out and stands at the mouth of the cave. And it says, then a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Here's the thing. The text doesn't actually even say that the Lord was or wasn't in the gentle whisper. Elijah heard the gentle whisper. That caused him to go back out, stood at the mouth of the cave, and heard the voice of the Lord. Ask him again for the second time, what are you doing here, Elijah? See, it's easy to assume that God did or didn't speak in the wind, in the earthquake, in the fire. But looking at the text, it seems by implication, it seems that Elijah experienced a variety of forces on the mountain to show him that God can reveal himself in a variety of ways. He's not limited. It's like God, it's not like God only speaks through the still small voice, through the gentle whisper. It's fascinating to me as I was reading this over and over um, in my quiet time with God in the morning for the last few weeks, it's been in the book of Acts. And it's always amazing to me how things dovetail. God is certainly in the details of our lives. In Elijah's story, in 1 Kings 19, there was wind, earthquake, fire, and then the gentle whisper at the end. In Acts chapter 2, there's wind and fire. Because when a church begins at Pentecost, in fact, last week was the celebration of Pentecost. That's one of the reasons I was reading through Acts. But... Um, it says that the Holy Spirit de descended on them when the church began um, and the Spirit came down. It says there was this rushing mighty wind and there was, it's a, it describes them as looking like tongues of fire on them. So there was wind and fire in Acts 2. In Acts 4, after um, two, I think Peter and John, I think, but they, they get arrested, they get out, they come back um, and everybody prays. And in Acts, you'll notice that's one of the things they're always doing. They're always praying about things. And after they're praying for boldness to share, to continue to share the gospel, even though there's persecution coming, it says the whole place was shaken 
and then they were filled with the Spirit. So there was this huge shaking. So we have the wind, we have the fire, we have the shaking. In Acts 16, Paul and Silas go to prison. You remember, they get in prison, they get put down in a dungeon, they get shackled, they can't deal with them till tomorrow. And so they, they have handcuffs on, they have shackles on, they're chained, they're in the prison, and they're praising God because they know God's in control. In the middle of a very bad situation, they're singing and worshiping and praising God. And it says, that in the middle of the night, there was an earthquake. And what the earthquake did is it shook and it didn't hurt them. It shook the doors loose and it shook the shackles off their hands and feet. And the guard was getting ready to kill himself because he thought that this is it for me. I was in charge of watching them and they're all loose. And they said, wait, wait, we're still here. Don't do anything. And they, did, they hadn't left. They said, don't do anything. And he had been watching them worship. He had been hearing. And after not leaving, he looked at them and he said, what must I do to be saved? And it, and it turns out that that evening they got to share with him, his family, and him and his whole family got saved because of a very exciting story. But in Acts, there's still this wind and earthquake and fire and God speaking to people. You see, God can be in the big and in the dramatic. He can be in the wind. He can be in the earthquakes. He can be in the fire. In Elijah's story, here's what I think was happening. See, Elijah is used to big that's what Elijah's used to. Think back on some of the things that have happened in his story. First, he comes on the scene, and one of the first things he does is he tells the king, um, here's what God told me. I'm going to pray to God, and it's going to stop raining. It's not going to rain, and there's going to be a drought, and it ain't going to rain again until God tells me to pray, and I pray to him, and the rain comes back again. That's, that's a big deal. During that whole time and in much of Elijah's life, one of the things we see is miraculous provision, big time, miraculous provision for him. He goes, um, and right early on in his story, remember, he goes to the Kirith Ravine and ravens come. And it says they bring him bread and meat. I have a theory about that, and I can't prove this, but I think, I think the bread and, and the red meat, which I'm excited about, he eats meat, that's a great thing. I kind of think it's like bun and burger. You know, he, the ravens are bringing him uh, quarter pounders or something. I don't know. But birds bringing it, that's miraculous. Remember, he's drinking from the brook there. And this is during a drought when there is no water anywhere. He also, when, when the brook does dry up because it's time for him to move on, and he goes to see this widow of Zarephath and, and her only son about to die. They have enough oil and flour in a jar for one more meal. They're going to make cake die. And he says, make something for me first, and God's going to provide for you. And it's interesting, they do that, and for years, he stays there with her and her son, and that oil and that flour never run dry. And they keep living. In the middle of this very difficult situation, God miraculously provides um, for them. Near the end, the story we just read, God miraculously provided bread and water. He baked the bread for him and provided water for sustenance that was this miraculous provision that, that sustained him for a long period of time, which is another thing that Elijah's used to big stuff is, um, there was a number of times where he had this supernatural stamina. One time at the end of the drought, it says he ran to the city and he you know kind of yanked his robe up so he wouldn't trip on it. He passed the chariot because God gave him this, this supernatural speed and stamina. He was able to go for long periods of time, 40 days, 40 nights on the food God gave him. Um, when, remember when he was at the, the widow of Zarephath's place, at the end, when it's time for him to move on, the widow's son, her only son dies. And she's all distraught, obviously. She's thinking, what, did you come here just so that this bad thing could happen to me? Elijah takes him in, takes him upstairs, prays for him. And first instance we, that I think we know of, of this happening, um, because of his faith and, and praying to God, God raises his kid from the dead. There is a resurrection. We remember um, the story of, of him and, and the false prophets, of, of Baal and probably Asherah on Mount Carmel and how there's like 450 Baal prophets and 400 Asherah prophets and, and they got their, um, their uh, thing there with the, the, the altar there with their sacrifice on it and they're praying and cutting themselves and screaming and Elijah's kind of a little bit making fun of them. But at the end when Elijah prays, it says fire comes down from heaven. So Elijah's used to seeing the fire. The fire comes down from heaven. It says it, it burns up the sacrifice, burns up the wood. It burns up the altar 
made out of stone. It burns up the water in a trough that he had them pour around it and soak it so many times so that he could show that God is who God says he is. And it said it actually even burned up the dirt because the real God provides what false gods only promise. So Elijah is used to this big in his life, but now God's gonna show him something different. It's this gentle whisper, and it's an assignment that it's like not near as big as his assignments were in the past, but it's one that was just as important because he was supposed to anoint a couple people king that were going to kind of take care of the rest of the, the false prophets and stuff. But it was also to anoint Elisha because Elisha was going to begin to transition into the role of God's prophet. And he was going to be with Elijah for a while and learn from Elijah and kind of be mentored and discipled by him. And Elisha was going to become God's prophet. So this was that transition. It wasn't the end of the big stuff in Elijah's life. In fact, later in his life, there's still some big stuff, even fire. In 2 Kings 1, he's dealing with bad kings again because there's like a whole string of them. And this king wants Elijah to come, but Elijah knows if he does, the king's going to kill him. And, and what he does is the king stays safe back in his palace and he sends a captain and 50 men. The captain has 50 men he's in charge of. And he sends them to Elijah and says, he tells him, you know, man of God, the king wants you to come down. And so Elijah, it says in verse 10, Elijah answered, answered the captain, if I am a man of God, may fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. Then fire fell from heaven and consumed the captain and his men. And it's like, you know, there's just ashes there. It says in the next verse, at this, the king, who remembers safe back in his palace, the king sent to Elijah another captain with his 50 men. And the captain comes, says the same thing. Man of God, this is what the king says. Come down at once. And Elijah's like, oh, if I am a man of God, Elijah replied, may fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. Then the fire of God fell from heaven and consumed him and his 50 men. Amazing story. In fact, you want, might want to go and read that in 2 Kings 1. Interesting thing happens is the king um, is not deterred by this and sends a third captain and his 50 men. But when that captain gets there with his 50 men, he kind of looks over and sees, you know, the ashes on the ground. It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. I know. I know you're a man of God, Elijah. Kind of pleads with him and, and the story shifts at that point. It's kind of interesting, but the, there's still big stuff like that in Elijah's life. In light of all this, in light of all those things that happened in Elijah's life, I love the ending. At least it's the earthly ending, the, the end of Elijah's earthly thing at this point in time, because actually he'll be back, but that's a whole nother story. But I love the ending of Elijah's story from, from the first and second Kings. Elijah and Elisha have been hanging out together for a while. Elijah's been teaching him and training him and mentoring him and discipling him. And Elisha's been learning and watching him and, and they've been doing this together. And so in 2 Kings 2.11, it says, as they were walking along, that's Elijah and Elisha. They, they both know we're kind of getting near the end now. That it's, it's going to transition from Elijah to Elisha now. It says, as they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them. So as they're there walking, out of heaven comes this chariot that's fire being pulled by a horse that's fire. And I assume being driven by an angel. I don't know if the angels like fire or not, the host of heaven, the armies of heaven, but comes down and gets in between them, separates the two of them. And it says, and Elijah went up to heaven in guess what? A whirlwind. So we have fire in this and we have wind in this again. Um, in fact, this is like a Bible trivia question because a lot of people will say, Elijah never died. He went to heaven in a chariot of fire. It's like, no, he didn't. He went to heaven in a whirlwind. It's like the wind took him to heaven and the chariot of fire and the horses of fire are just what separated him from Elisha. So Elisha wasn't there, but he was close enough that he could watch and see what happened. So we have wind, we have earthquake, we have fire. 
we have the the the, the closeness of the gentle whisper um, when when we think about the wind and the earthquake and the fire and the shaking and the whirlwind and everything to me it's like yeah that's 2020 in a nutshell 2020 has been absolutely crazy hasn't it I know it's hard for me to even believe that this is this is the first Sunday in June and and it feels it feels like March 123rd to me and not the, the June already but Here's, here's what I believe this passage is saying to us today. God can speak to anyone, anytime, in any way he wants to. My guess is he's speaking to people in all of those ways during this crazy year that is 2020. Through the, the whole COVID-19 pandemic and all that goes along with it. The job stuff, the, the pain, the hurt the isolation, through all the stuff that goes with it. I think God is speaking to people in that situation through the pain and the hurt that is racism that we've seen come to an ugly head in the last few weeks again. And, and racism, that's something God hates. But God can even speak through these things. He can speak through the protests and the riots. He doesn't cause the bad things, but he speaks to us. Here, I think, is the most important thing. For you to hear today. I think it's why God brought you to our stream here today online to hear this thing. I think he's trying to speak to you as well. Through the wind, through God's whirlwind, the one that blows through our lives, tearing the mountains apart in our lives, shattering the rocks just like it did on Mount Horeb. I believe he's trying to speak to you um, possibly through the wind, through the whirlwind, and maybe through the earthquakes, the earthquakes that, that rattle the very foundations that we're standing on, shaking what we mistakenly believe is like solid and dependable, what only God is. Is he trying to speak to you through those earthquakes in your life? Or maybe through the fire, the fire that burns up everything that's not really as important as we believed it was and leaves us bare before God, just facing him alone. Is he trying to speak to you through the fire? Because God can use those things in that way in your life. And yes, through the gentle whisper, through the still small voice, and maybe, maybe if we don't listen to the still small voice, to the gentle whisper, he'll have to send the wind or the earthquake or the fire, okay? So don't give up, don't quit, don't get discouraged. Hear this, listen for him because he's speaking to you. In one of those ways or one of a million different ways, he's trying to speak to you. So listen for him, but then listen to him. Hear what he has to say. And then most importantly, obey him. Whatever he asks you to do. As you start listening for him, in fact, I would say, God, I'm going to be listening for you so that when I hear your voice, I can listen to you. And I'm telling you right now, whatever you ask me, the answer is yes. I'll do whatever you ask. See, twice God asked Elijah this question. What are you doing here, Elijah? Twice. What are you doing here, Elijah? I think God might be asking the same question of you in the midst of all that's going on around us. Maybe, what are you doing here, Tim? What are you doing here during this time? What are you doing here with all this weirdness and craziness? What are you doing? Are you listening to me? Are you really listening to me and obeying me? And I think he might be asking you the same question. And he's asking you not because he doesn't know the answer. He's asking you because it's for you. He wants you to speak it. He wants you to verbalize it. He wants you to be able to say it. And maybe you're going to complain a little bit like Elijah did. God can take it. He just wants us to come out the other end listening to him and obeying him. So how can God reveal himself to us? Any way he wants. And don't just think uh, bad things happening to you, okay? Because those same things, God can use those same things, the wind, the earthquake, the fire, you know, all that. He can use those same things to work for us as well. Just like he does for Israel, 
both in fact in Isaiah 29 it says this it was it was written about their time period but it had implications all the way to the end to the end times it says this God says in Isaiah 29 6 I the Lord of heaven's armies will act for you get this with thunder and earthquake and great noise with whirlwind and storm and consuming fire see he can use those same things for us in our life to bring us through things and to save us from things we never thought that we could get out of so what's it going to be don't give up don't quit don't get discouraged listen for him listen for him He's speaking, and I don't know which way he's speaking to you. Get into his word. Spend time with him every morning. Tell, I want to hear you, God. And don't quit. Don't get discouraged. Listen for him. Listen to him. And then whatever he says, obey him. I'd like to, to just briefly pray um, with you and pray for you. Um, and then we'll jump into the update. But let me pray. God, I believe there's people here today. They're listening right now. And they know that the reason they came here is because they can kind of hear you, but they're really not listening. They kind of have this idea that you're trying to get a hold of them, and maybe they've just now realized that it was you. And I pray that today they would, they would pause and not only listen for you, but when you speak, listen to you. Hear you speak from your word, speak into our minds, into our hearts, and then whatever you ask of us, that it would be yes. Whether it's helping those around us and loving those around us, whether it's coming to you for the first time and saying, Jesus, I, I, I don't have a relationship with you. It's just this church thing. And maybe, maybe it's just something that they've tried out online for the first time but they hear that there's a savior that came for them, lived for them, died for them, rose again, and is coming again. And by recognizing that their sin separated them from God and turning from that, turning to Jesus and say, I don't understand it all, Jesus, but I'm yours. That they can come into that relationship with you and hear you today. My prayer, Father, is that whatever you ask of us today, our answer would be yes. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to say that the elders have been, um, and the staff, we've all been talking and praying and planning. And, and as we pray and plan and propose paths, you know, to pursue, to begin this transition back to meeting in person again, I want to say that the decisions we've made have not ever been made out of fear. They have been made out of love. We're not afraid. We have God on our side that God of the wind, the whirlwind, and the earthquake, and the fire, we have him on our side. Our decisions have not and will not be made out of fear. They're made out of love. They're made out of love for you. They're made out of love for our community. They're made out of love for the people who maybe have never even been to our church, but they've checked us out online, and, and they're going to stop in to a service and see what's up. So how we as a church and how you as a follower of Jesus move ahead in all this as things loosen up a little bit, that's not determined. It shouldn't be determined. And our choices as a church will not be determined by political views or wherever you happen to fall on a spectrum of opinion. Okay, It needs to be based on the life, death, resurrection, and return of Jesus. That's where the decisions are based. We are to love God and love people. That's what we're supposed to do. So here's what's going to happen. Uh, let me just quickly say you can still sign up to be a microsite leader on the ministries page of journeyinourchurch.com. There's also a place there on the bottom to sign up um, to join a microsite group. So you'll want to do that. But here's the thing. Things change by the day. Things change by the week. They're constantly changing at the moment. Here's the plan. Next Sunday, June 14th, we're going to have, Lord willing, an outdoor service. I say Lord willing because it's Minnesota. You never know what the weather is going to be like. Weather permitting, we're going to have an outdoor service on our property, a couple miles north of the church on 61, you know, north of McDonald's Road there. We're going to have an outdoor service, and here's what we're going to do. If you are ready and raring to go, and he's like, yep, I'm packing my blanket, my lawn chair right now. We're going to have a spot for you there. 
If you're saying, I'd like to come, but I'm still a little bit worried, I'd like to stay in my car. Stay in your car and you'll tune your radio to the station we give you and you'll be able to sit in your car and see what's happening on stage and not only see, but you'll be able to hear it over your radio at the same time we are and you'll be able to be there, you'll be able to see people and experience that and you don't even have to get out of your car. So you'll be able to do whichever you want. That's what we're gonna shoot for and try to do for the 14th, which is not <clears throat> today, it's next Sunday, okay? And remember, weather permitting, we don't know what the change, we don't know what's gonna happen with the weather in seven days, anything could happen. Um, and from now on, we're online. So if we're, if we're there, we're still gonna be online. We may be slightly delayed in terms of, we won't do it right away. We'll, we'll have it online a little bit later that afternoon. Um, but if the weather's gonna be bad or something's gonna happen and we call it, we will still be online. That's next Sunday, the 14th. Then two weeks from today, the 21st, Lord willing, with some restrictions, we will be back in the building. I can hear some of you cheering already. I am so excited to see you again. There's gonna be some restrictions, but the restrictions were lifted um, enough on Friday that we think we can make it work. We might have to do something unusual. Not sure what that is yet, but over the next two weeks, we're gonna be planning. We're gonna to try to have updates throughout the week, but there will almost always be an update, remember, at Wednesday at 7 p.m. So you can go to Facebook. If you're not on Facebook, you can go to YouTube to Journey North Church on YouTube, and we'll have the update around 7 p.m. on Wednesday. If there's anything else that needs to be updated, we'll try to let you know that the update is also on the website on journeynorthchurch.com. So next Sunday, Lord willing, outside at the church property, you can bring a blanket or a lawn chair and sit out there in front of the stage and take, you know, be a part of that with proper physical distancing, you know, there's still not going to be any hugging or whatever. Um, there's not going to be coffee or treats. There's not going to be bathrooms. We're not allowed to do that yet with the porta potties and stuff. So I, I'm, I'm putting on my, my, my parent thing right now. I'm going to say, could you please go to the bathroom become, before you come to the service next week so that you don't have to get in your car and leave in the middle of it? Just saying. And then the 21st, Lord willing, um, with some restrictions, we will be back in the building. So all that could change tomorrow. And if it is, we'll update you. But that's our plan at the moment. So I can't wait to see you, hopefully in person. We love you. And maybe next week, we'll see you out at the property. Thanks for joining us today. Have a great week.